welcome to Straight Talk with Carl Lisa Thorne. And I have with me today Diana Boer. And we're going to be talking all about communications because her business is all about communications. And she has a business called Boer Consultants. So welcome, Diana. Thank you. It's great to be with you, Carly. So I know your business is literally all about communications. So first of all, I'd love for you to tell us, how did you get into communications? What was your inspiration behind getting into the business? Well, actually, I just didn't have a grand plan. It's just that I wanted something to work from home. I had small children and thought I thought that communication is one of those things that you can do anything with, and you've got to have a communication is the basis for whether you work and uh, you need to get along with people or whether you're staying at home, you've got a marriage to hold together, whatever you do, you've got to communicate. So that's that was the impetus and I wrote a book and the rest is history. So that is something also I'd love to get into a little bit down into the interview. However, I'd love for you to actually start with what are some of the biggest pain points in the industry and in communication? Well, we basically it's communication is the basic business act. So you're communicating whatever you do, whether you're writing email, whether you're delivering presentation, when you're trying to communicate from one department to another, whatever you do, you've got to communicate to make it happen. I mean, basically nothing happens in business until you do you tell somebody about it, do you have a meeting, do you talk? That's what pushes action forward. So there's there's a problem when that doesn't happen in any kind of project. So that that's the essence of any any job anywhere that you're conducting business. So there's all kind of opportunity. So let's get into some of those those actual pain points. So in your opinion, what are some of the the most critical points that people miss on when they're communicating, whether they're negotiating or having a one-to-one -one communication with somebody? Well, I think first of all, most of it is oral and w one of the key things is we just don't listen to what people are saying to us and that for any number of reasons. You know, we assume that we know what they're about to say based on our experience of where, where they think we're going. Sometimes we don't make up our mind that we want to listen. Um, we don't like the person, you know, you don't like how they look, you don't like what they said to you last, you know, last year or last week in a meeting, so you don't believe them, so there's a lack of credibility there. All of those are reasons for not listening. And in customer service, that, that's terrible. You know, you have a policy in your mind, somebody comes in and they tell you this or that or the other over o online, and so you just don't, you don't absorb what they're saying to you. So that's a major problem, whether you're presenting in the boardroom or it's an entry level. So that's a, that's a key problem. Well, one thing I'd also like to add to that is how many times when we're listening to someone, we already have the next question in our, in our mind. So again, we're not listening. We're already formulating what we want to ask next. Right. So that, that goes to your listening point. Right. A and huge then, one. And, and I know I'm guilty of that. I know sometimes I've done that. I'm like, okay, I already, want, I already know what I want to ask next. So I'm not in listening mode in that moment. And right. I'm catching myself. <laughs> right. And, and you start... You know, planning when they're doing a presentation, you're you don't listen to the next point. You're let's say you're, they're giving you three or four reasons, and you're thinking you're hung up on reason two, and you're writing notes. I'm going to ask them, and so you miss reason three and four, and so you know there's that's fraught with mistakes and and problems. And I think another part of that oral that big oral communication problem or, or basket is if you're on the other end of it, you're speaking and you're doing the presentation. That's fraught with problems and pain because people go in thinking they have the right information for all those listeners out there and they have all kinds of problems presented. The, one of the key problems in making a presentation is they people go in and they do a data dump. They just, here's a bunch of information and they, they the, the, the standard line is they show up and throw up. You know, here's all the information. And when I talk to executives frequently, they say, don't just give me information, tell, tell, tell a story. And what they mean by that is not literally tell a story, although that's not a bad idea, but they don't interpret it. But when they throw out all this data, they need to say, and so the point of that is, you know, and here's some more if you're going to give data, if you're technical, and the point of that is they, they just don't interpret it. And that's a key problem. Um, disorganization, they don't, they don't give a 
a bottom line. They just did a blog, and in fact, and I was using a metaphor of uh, driving someplace. If you're used to GPS, you know, and if you're that GPS sometimes is behind you when you're, you know, you're ready to turn and you think, oh, they gotta tell me, they gotta tell me what's the road up ahead. And if they, they say, well, there's six lines. Now, if you go to the stream left, you, you'll end up in Chicago. But if you take the road to the right, you're gonna. And if they, by the time they get all that explanation, you're already past the, you're already past the intersection. And and that's the way some people do presentations. So I've always told my clients one of the things that's really key is like even at an event is give people an agenda of the meeting and also not only tell them orally, actually type it out. So when they get to the meeting, you're passing out a piece of paper. It's like, okay, here's the agenda of the meeting. Here are the talking points. Like I asked you, let's have actually some talking points. What are we talk? What are some of the talking points we're going to be addressing to give the public some tips and tools on communication? So here's a printed out piece of paper of our talking points. This is what we're going to be addressing in our meeting, in our agenda for today. And that right. actually helps. And it also keeps us on track as the speaker or presenter, does it not? And, and one thing that's even more important than giving an agenda, yes, definitely, it's a great idea. They need to have the agenda written and oral. But they need to not just introduce a topic, they need to tell them the point about that topic. And the, the frequent problem in a presentation is that people stand up to that executive or whatever audience they're addressing, and they say something like, um, I want to, or the purpose of my presentation today is to talk about the cost involved in taking a team on such and such field investigation. Well, and the executive is thinking, okay, what about it? Are you going to tell me how much it costs, or we should go, or we shouldn't go, or it's too much, or we, what we're supposed to find out? So they need to make a summary statement. They need to open up with saying, I don't think it's a good idea to go to Chicago on this field trip with our marketing team because X. They need to actually summarize about each of those topics on the agenda and then support their point. And if they don't, that audience, they're, they're just wandering all over the place thinking, are you going to tell me yes or no, or we should or we shouldn't, or it's too expensive. So they need to give a summary point. And that's a key mistake in a presentation. That's a very valid point because they're all, they're, again, they're lost a little bit and they're also in anticipation or they're with an expectation, which is even worse. Right, right. And, and sometimes um, they argue, if they're trying to make a persuasive presentation, they argue both sides of the fence. You know, they'll say, well, here's an issue that we should resolve. And there are a couple of approaches. We could do A, or we could do B, or we could do C, and here's some pros and cons for A, and here's some pros. And the audience is, it's kind of like a jury trial. <laughs> They're kind of saying, guilty, not guilty, guilty, not guilty, maybe. And when they go to the jury room, you know, they, they stay behind the, the closed doors for three days trying to decide. And that's, that's the quandary you're putting a, a audience in when they don't know where you're going with it. So you want to always tell them up front. Uh, you know, that is, there are just so many mistakes, it's hard to say. Uh, here's another one that comes up frequently. People will, in a presentation frequently, just do start off, particularly salespeople, with all about me. You know, they start off with the background, let me tell you all about me. And of course the audience is saying, I don't want to know about you, I want to know about me. You know, tell me what you can do for me, what are the benefits here? So, you know, you hear that one all the time. And that's why, as, as I told you, it's like when I do these interviews, I don't, you know, go on, oh, I got Dana Boo here and she's, you know, this and that and this and that. And I do these radio shows because I want to give valuable content and tips and tools to others. For me, it's always about everyone else. It's not about me. It's not always necessarily about the guests because I always, first of all, I put together an entire blog post which is about you. So it does give, you know, the person's website. You know, I do talk about the books that they do. But I want it to be content rich about giving tips and tools to the audience because you're right. People don't want a five minute auditory bio about the person. They want, yes, they want to know about you. But I let you be the storyteller of you, but also it's about giving value to them. Right. Giving value to the audience. That's what these shows are about. And you're right, nobody wants to go someplace and hear a five minute oratory bio about the person standing there. They come there to learn. They come there to learn, play, and grow. That's the way I look at it. Because in playing, like children, when they're playing, when they're taking a toy, and they're taking it apart, and they're doing their imaginational play, they're learning. 
right? So when I go to a, a, any sort of conference, I'm there to learn, but I also want it to be fun. I don't want to sit there in a chair with my arms crossed and be bored out of my mind. I want it to be something that is witty. I want there to be some banter. I want there to be some sort of playful energy in there. There's nothing worse than being at a conference and you're bored out of your mind. I will not learn. I will turn my brain off because it's just boring, right? Right. There has to be some witty banter in there that engages your mind. Right. But how many times have you said in a, some kind of presentation at an industry conference or a sales presentation where the salesperson says, well, let me start off by introducing all the people and they introduce all their team. Well, let me tell you a little bit about our, co our company. We've been in business for 28 years and let me tell you about this office and that office. And the, the buyers or the potential buyers are just totally tuned out because they're saying, what can you do for me? I want to know what you can do for me. Don't tell me about your organization. Now, after they learn what you can do for them, then they want to know your experience. It's just, can you pull it off? They want to know, are you capable now of doing what you said you could do for me? But that's a different that's, you're, And you're, it's, it's totally counterintuitive. You're absolutely correct because we're trained to you know, bravado about ourselves, but it's counterintuitive. It always should be about giving value and the tips and tools first. Once you've got them excited about what you've taught them, then they want to know who you are. They're going to want to know your website. They're going to want to know how to get a hold of you. Right. Right. Absolutely. Yeah, and you were asking about where this communication thing shows up, where these mistakes and the points of pain. When, when I started out, you know, I told you I started out just saying communication. If you stacked all relationships end to end, they would all be about communication. Another one that we run into all the time is email. Just that is a constant source of pain for people because they have to do it. You have to do it to stay in business. But when people get long emails that ramble on and on and you get to the end and I call it the so what document. You, you read to the end and you think, so what? what? What are you asking me to do? Do you want me to, to do something, call somebody, go to a meeting, uh, support you, uh, send you something, approve something? The, the action is not clear. And that's a huge problem. If you have to respond back and say, uh, what is it exactly you're asking me to do? And then they have to write you again and say, well, what I wanted you to do was, and then give you the details again, instead of having two interactions, now you've got to have four or five interactions. That's a huge waste of time for everybody involved. Absolutely. As a matter of fact, I just created a graphic as a social media tip today. To, you know, people are involved in social media, obviously, and we're all in groups, and we cross-market and all this. And it's amazing how many times people don't think we're not mind readers. What do you want people to do for you? So people just assume because you put your link in a cross-marketing group that people automatically know what you want them to do with their blog. Do you want me to comment? Do you want me to share it? What do you want me to do with it? Not everybody wants you. Some people obviously want the comments, but some people actually want you to do something with it. They actually want you to share it and comment. Some people just want you to actually share it. They don't want a ton of comments because they know sometimes that looks like it's falsified, if you will, that it's, it's, it's a cross-marketing group, if you will, right? So it's like, we're not mind readers. Please tell me, what do you want me to do with your link? What do you want me to, like you said, what do you want me to do for you? So I actually put in there, in the groups, it's like, specify what you want. Do you yeah. want your link retweeted? Do you want it, <laughs> what do you want me to do? So please specify yeah. in the groups what you need. And people just think because you're in a cross-marketing social media group that everybody knows that because it says it's, it's Twitter day, that that means this. Or if you're in Google day, it means this. Well, no. You must tell people what to do. You know, you may assume that just, you know, again, assumption, don't assume. Be specific as to what you want from people. And, like, you, it, it, it'll avoid a lot of disappointment. <laughs> right. And that action should always come up front. What happens is many times people go through all the details. It's like when you pick up your voicemail it, and somebody says, uh, I was in Kansas last week and I was talking to a friend of mine there and he has this co contact and they go through this big long one minute long email and you're thinking hurry up I only have 30 minutes for lunch and I'm, what you want them to do instead is to say 
I need a referral from you to somebody you know on Facebook. Their name is Joe Schmo. Please give me that phone number. Now, here's the background. And, and then if you think, I don't know Joe Schmo and I don't have his phone number, there's no use you listening to the other two minutes of that voicemail because you don't know the person. They need You need to just forward it on to somebody else. So they need to always put the action right up front, whereas most people write all the detail and put the action at the end. And when you get down to the end, you think, I can't do this. This doesn't apply to me. I don't need this. And again, you've wasted their time. And, and exactly, and most people don't get, we're all busy. We all have businesses. We all, and some people are married, have children, and a bunch of other things going on. We have to honor and respect each other's time. And too many people don't think of that. And also it comes down to too many people are afraid to ask, so they do put it at the bottom. So I think they need to put all this preamble first. So they do the preamble, and then they put the action last. We need to step up to the plate and have confidence in ourselves. And if we are friends with these people, we shouldn't be afraid to ask our friends for referrals. That's what, by the way, collaboration means. <laughs> if we're in social media and if we're in business, at least I'm not afraid to ask my friends that I'm in business with to ask for a referral or ask for some sort of connection. That's what social means, and to me that's what collaborational means. And by the way, if you're in business... Right, why another good point here. When you said sometimes people are not direct, so you mentioned some people are not direct, that right. is another key point of pain, the language they use. They'll say something like, this, this um, document really should be reviewed for, uh, for gaps in details. Well, you notice that language. They took out the people. This document should be reviewed. Well, who's going to do that? I know at your house, at my house, if we say, hey, the garage should be cleaned out this Saturday, you know who will clean it out? <laughs> Me. If you, don't, if you don't call somebody's name, things don't get done on the job. So you need to be very direct with who does action. You need to say, I will be reviewing this document in the next week and forward it to you. Or, Carly, would you please review this document and add any necessary details? Or, would John's team please review this and get back to us? You need to specify people. And in, in the name of being courteous, like you said, sometimes people think they're being polite by saying this document really needs to be reviewed and had, have more details added. They think they're being courteous, but they're really just being unclear. So a key thing is to always make sure you put the doer of the action into the email so that everybody's not just guessing, well, who's supposed to do that? And I add to that the whole, you know, we've heard this phrase, I think, at nauseum, do it, delegate it, or delete it from your plate. So it's either you're going to take the action to do it, or you're going to delegate it and name that person that's being delegated to or if it's not serving your team or serving your company, delete it from the task list. We, and, and I think also a part is, as you and I are both females in business, I think a lot of, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to say a lot of females, and I'm, that's just what I've noticed, aren't, they're not, I guess the, the male energy part of being a female and taking that, standing up in that shoes, in other words, they're afraid of doing that because it's, then they're too macho, to, to have too much of that male energy. And I, and I think we need to separate that. We can still be females and still have the confidence and still delegate. In other words, you know what I'm saying? I think when females do take on that role of CEO language, right, there's that intimidation for some. And I've felt that. I know I work with a lot of males. And when females do step up in that role and do, you know, say, okay, this needs to be done, a lot of females are afraid to go there because of that energy. Do you know what I'm saying? Well, I think there's that lack of confidence sometimes, but sometimes that needs to happen. And, and, and if you want to rise up in the world, and I don't, I don't mean that in a bad way, but you know what I'm saying, there has to be confidence in order to do that. We have to be able to say, if you want to, if you want to be successful in business, there has to be the authority, and I don't mean in a bad way. There, it's, it's not even authority, it's confidence. Because right, it has to do with confidence, but people sometimes people do it not for lack of confidence. It's it's actually a grammatical thing. It's the difference between using active voice and, and passive voice. And I'm not throwing I'm throwing out a grammatical term that somebody wants to. Yeah, look it up and to yeah, I was like, trying to find taking out people. You know what I'm they, they just take out people and say. Um, in other words, it's the difference between what we call a writing voice and a talking voice. Somebody will meet you in the hallway and they'll say something like. Um, you know, I'm going to um, put this in an email to you next week. 
and you'll say, yeah, why don't you, why don't you give me an, uh, an email on that and I'll take it into my boss for approval. They'll go back to their computer and they'll write, this should be uh, put in writing and sent to our client. They'll say it orally, I'm going to put this in writing and send it over to the client. They'll write it, this should be documented in a, in a formal report and sent to the client. They, it, they, they have two voices, they have a writing voice and a talking voice and that's called active voice and passive voice, that's the grammatical term. But what we're saying here really doesn't always have to do with confidence, it's just a matter of not making it two voices. You shouldn't have a writing voice and a talking voice. It's what people think is quote official and what's not official and there shouldn't be that difference of writing style. You should write like you talk minus grammatical errors. We all make grammatical errors when we speak. It should just be a, a straightforward language and putting people in. That, and I'll add to that also, is authenticity. Yes. Part of what I would say social media online reputation goes along with be the same way you are on stage as you are off stage. I can't <laughs> tell you how many times I've met speakers and other people, whether it be authors or my clients or people that I work with that I consult with, that time and time and time I have to tell them, you have to decide what face you're going to show. And that face needs to be the same face you're going to show on social media, on Twitter, on any other social media platform, on stage, off stage, out at a restaurant, or I don't care where you are. And the same thing applies with actress, actors, or any other or business that you're in. Because guess what? It comes out. It's going to be found out whether you like it or not. And, and it's the same thing I tell whether it's a male client or a female client. And, and that I, I tend to work, I, my population of clientele is pretty much even with males and females. I do have a, another section of clients that females that are working on, like I, that's what I was talking about, that balance of um, working with the female energy coming up with the male energy, and that's why I was talking about it, because I've seen that a lot with females that are working on that confidence and stepping into those shoes, and some of them have had that little bit of fear of that male energy, because they're afraid if they step into that, that um, it'll be taken wrong. And, right. um, and so that's why I said, and I agree with you, I totally agree with you on that passive, and um, the passive, and, or some people call it submissive, which I don't like that word, um, having the same voice. And, yeah. I, and I, I like to put that with authenticity, because authenticity is so important today. Transparency. Right. In the book, Creating Personal Presence, I talk about these four categories. The look, talk, think, and act like a leader. And in there, there's a whole chapter, whole section on authenticity. What you say and do should match who you are. There shouldn't be a difference. I'm glad you, glad you brought that point up. So let's get into speaks now that we're getting into some of that, and I'd love for you to actually talk about. Um, I know you're a brilliant author, so let's actually talk about um, some of your books because I know in those books people actually find value because you do have a lot of tips and tools in there. So, um, what are some of the books that you've written, and um, can you give some pithy, uh, what I would say, uh, summaries of what they would find in there would, would really bring some value to them and tips and tools that would enrich their lives? All right, that one I just mentioned, creating personal presence, is on presence. Twenty tips on what you do to show confidence, how you see it in your body language, think on your feet, a formula for thinking on your feet. Communicate with confidence is on interpersonal skills. From being persuasive, running effective meetings, giving advice, listening, answering questions, tough questions. So it's it's the most comprehensive, twelve over twelve hundred tips just on 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 that interpersonal skills. The one that I have coming out in January is on persuasion, and it has nine what I call nine counterintuitive principles. Let me give you one out of there. You know, most people think like if they're applying for a job or they're trying to get a promotion, they think something to be uh, persuasive that you should give. Um, the more you give, the more persuasive you are. And let's say you're giving your your um, credentials for something. You want to get promoted in your company. Let's say you had a a PhD in this particular area, and you you had a patent on this particular expertise, and you had 15 years experience. And let's say they were going to send you to South America because you were bilingual and and you thought, oh well, I, you know, I'm not that fluent, but I have spent a couple of years down there. 
So should you put all four of those criteria on, on a resume or maybe not the fact that you were there two years ago or whatever? The research, most people would say, well, I'll go ahead and list those four things. Can't hurt that I spent a couple of years in South America and they want, they might send me to Peru. The research says that you really shouldn't list that last thing because a PhD is great. You've had 10 years experience in, in the area and you've got a patent. Those three are like 10s if you're rating everybody 1 to 10. But that last one is kind of weak. What people do instead of adding, you know, that's a 10, that's a 10, that's a 10. Well, the fact that they went there two years ago, that's, eh, that's only a three. They average in their mind rather than saying, well, if I'm ranking all the five people that I interviewed for this job, they would, instead of saying, that's a 10, that's a 10, that's a 10, that's a 3. On average, this is an 8 candidate. But if you just left off and didn't mention the fact that you speak a little Spanish because you were there two years ago, and you just gave them the three qualifications, the PhD, 10 years experience, and the patent, they'd say, oh, this is a 10 candidate because those three all rank a 10. That's a counterintuitive principle because most people think the more I can tell you, the better, instead of the averaging principle. So that book covers some counterintuitive principles about being persuasive. If you're going to talk your kid into staying in school or, you know, whatever you have to do to persuade some, someone. Oh, Call that's going to be a great one. Let's also um, tell people where they can find you because we are also doing this as a podcast. Okay, it's Boor.com is the website. Boor.com. And most people are not, since they can't read your name right now, let's spell that out for them as well. It's B-O-O-H-E-R. B-O-O-H-E-R.com. It's like putting the bar, except I hope they don't. <laughs> I'd okay. also love for you to, let's lay out at least a couple more tips for people on communication. Because we've done some really solid tips and tools. But before I let you go, I'd love to leave at least a couple more solid tips with people on communications. We've covered emails, we've covered some presentations. What are some last tips and tools you'd love to leave the audience with? I think uh, another good tip on running an effective meeting is uh, we haven't covered meetings, but just in a general way uh, with presentations, because most meetings involve a presentation, is when you set up your agenda, you mentioned agendas that instead of setting up topics, which most people do, they'll say something like um, sh um, the cost of so-and-so or overview of the industry meeting we attended or whatever, word those topics in questions. For example, instead of saying um, trip to Chicago, it should say should we make the trip to Chicago? Instead of saying uh, results of employee survey, it should say Will the results of an employee survey serve our purposes for the coming year? If you word your agenda on a meeting in a question format, you immediately focus the discussion on the issue at hand. And it reduces your discussion time to the essential evidence. And you don't waste a lot of time on extemporaneous, I mean, extraneous details. Also, so it really reduces meeting time. And what you said is really valuable because, I don't know, well, a lot of people I think know this scientific fact. Questions hook the mind. Yes. Uh, they've actually done a study where they put people in a PETA scan and they ask someone a math question and then they watch what fires up in their brain. And the brain will automatically go to the place of trying to solve the math problem. No different if you ask your brain, like before you go to bed at night, they will they do the same type of study. They'll ask the person a question before they go to sleep and they, they'll actually watch their brain waves while they're sleeping and the brain goes to the same place trying to solve that question. So our brain abhors a vacuum. It wants to solve things. So if you when you ask and the same thing when you're posting anywhere or when you're doing a blog post title, the same thing asking putting the title in the form of a question. So it's a really great thing that you said always ask people a question because they will actually then want the answer. <laughs> um, it does. We do not like being left with a question. We want the answer. Our brain then goes to trying to solve the question. 
such a great, great, valuable tip and tool. Okay. Another great is um, when you are trying to persuade someone, you always want to make sure you appeal to their emotion more so than logic. People want logic because that's where they take something in to convince someone else. But you'll never win them with a logical explanation. People make decisions based on emotion and then they support it with logic when they have to explain it to someone else. Absolutely. So, as most people think that if they have data that that wins an argument, no, it supports an argument but it doesn't win an argument. And people often hate to rely on experience but people can argue with your data all the time. You see that happen in political races. They'll have the same uh, numbers and for example they'll say let's say you have a number like 22% uh, of home buyers uh, paid more for their home market their home mortgage went up well one side might say well that's that's pretty good because that means that the home prices people had more money to spend this year so they could afford more houses and then the other side will say that's terrible we should, they should, you realize how much of that income that they're having to spend for their house? So they'll take the same statistic and interpret it different ways to tell a different story. So numbers are never convincing. Data, facts are never convincing. But when you argue from your experience and someone says, well, that'll never work because whatever, and you come back and say, in my experience of 22 years of installing this kind of pipe in houses, my experience tells me from work with such and such clients that you're going to be disappointed with it. They can't argue with your experience. Your experience is your experience. So they can give their opinion, they can give their experience, but your experience is your experience. Your opinion is your opinion. And so don't ever shy away from and think that what you have to say as an expert in your field is not persuasive. It is. Appeal to the emotion. In an, in, but never and know what the facts are, know what the data is. We're not saying don't do that, but never expect the logical argument to win the case or win the business or win the decision or make someone adopt your recommendation. Well, thank you so much for joining me. It's been an absolute delight having you. Um, you've given us such an amazing valuable tips and tools and I'm just very much in appreciation that you took such time out of your schedule to be with me. Thank you Carla, I enjoyed it. I always love having witty banters with intelligent people, it's, it's absolutely a delight. Thank you, thank you, enjoyed it. So um, as everybody knows, I put together an entire blog post, you'll be able to find all of Diana's beautiful information and all her books, her website, and everything you could possibly want. I look forward to bringing you more valuable content next week. You've been with your host, Carly Alyssa Thorne. You can find me at CarlyAlyssaThorne.com, which is C-A-R-L-Y-A-L-Y-S-S-A-T-H-O-R-N-E.com. I wish everyone a wonderful afternoon and evening, and I will see you next week. And once again, thank you so much, Diana, and I look forward to many more conversations.